If I take all the stable tones of a scale, we're now back in C major, and I play them all at once together, I get a very stable C major chord. This is a very pleasant and lush couch to sit on. We don't need to go anywhere. This is the chord which you hear at the beginning of the Waldstein Sonata in a slightly different range and arrangement. Even if I pick only two of the stable tones, C and E, we're perfectly at ease. But spend too much time on your couch and at some point you'll yearn for a little bit of adventure. Take some of the active and unstable tones, for example, B and F, and combine them together, and we get a sound which is much harsher. Not a place you want to linger around for too long. Actually, its role is to make you look forward to plopping back onto the couch. So when we come back to C and E, we feel a natural resolution. The two active tones, B and F, individually drove us back to the tones C and E, respectively. You can hear this drive towards resolution even more clearly if I add a G in the bass, together with the two active notes, B and F. These three notes powerfully drive us back to the tonic C. Well, hold on, you might think. How come that G, a stable tone, wants to jump back to C? We actually need to do a little update to our relational map of the scale. Because what I left out earlier is that there is a wormhole between the fifth note of the scale and the first. A wormhole which can lead us directly and very powerfully back to the tonic. The name for the fifth note of the scale, you might have heard it, it's the dominant. So even though G is a stable tone in the context of C major, it also has the drive to move and it does so like the knight in a game of chess, jumping over all the other notes of the scale, straight back to the tonic. You've heard this in countless pieces of music which really want to drive home the notion that the piece has ended. You'll hear something like this. And in the bass you have G, C. Or any sort of umpa umpa type of music. C, C, G, C, G. Now, why is that that the fifth tone, the dominant, has any drive towards the tonic at all? A possible explanation could be that when we play the note G, we also hear its most prominent overtones the partials D and B. Now, in the context of C major, we can look at the roles that D and B have, and you see that both notes are active in the directions of the tonic C. B is the leading tone, and D the descending leading tone. So the note G contains within itself two prominent partials which act as leading tones to C. There is something within the nature of G which points to C, and this might be what generates this hidden wormhole. And so, when we combine G and some of C major's most active tones, like B and F, we get a very powerful, very potent, very active harmony which creates a desire in us to hear as the next harmony a stable C major chord. You could say that this is the source of motion and emotion in music. There's a very powerful example of all that being at play here in this Brahms intermezzo. It 
comes close to crime to stop here, doesn't it? You want it to go here, of course. And why do we send such a clear musical drive here? I want to show you that you'll be able to see for yourself that what you are experiencing on a sensual level is derived from what we've observed so far. Let's look at this chord. And at that point where we encounter this chord in the piece, we are in the key of E major. Now, remember that even if all the notes have different names in E major than in C major, the relationships are the same. So I'm just going to pull up a map of the E major scale so we won't be lost. This here is our chord. If you look at the individual notes, you will find the tonic E in the bass clashing together with the fourth note of the scale, an active tone, and the seventh tone, as you know, the leading tone, a highly active tone as well. This is a very explosive compound, especially since we get these highly unstable tones together with the stable tonic E. The bass then briefly moves to B, the fifth, and we get the same dominant chord that I introduced you to just a moment ago when we were in C major. If we now take a look at our map, we can observe where each note in this harmony is pointing to. Both A's want to move down to G sharp. The leading tone D sharp wants to move up to E. And the B in the bass can take the wormhole path straight to the tonic. In fact, this is exactly the resulting harmony that Brahms writes in this piece. What Brahms gives us in this moment in his piece is exactly what is being demanded by the major scale itself. All is well. You see that without having to learn any dry rules of music harmony, you can already perceive what governs motion and sensation in music. What you are experiencing on a sensual level is made possible by what is inherently existent in just one note. Remember, we started the beginning of Beethoven's Waldstein Sonata and observed that Beethoven seemed to be drawing a sort of evolution of music. A single note naturally gives birth to overtones, which creates a hierarchy, a pecking order within the notes of the scale, leading to harmony, out of which elements, ideas for a theme, are being derived and then further developed by Beethoven. The first note of the sonata in the sense implying a musical Big Bang. But in fact, this Big Bang is not solely the Big Bang for Beethoven's sonata. It is the Big Bang for all of Western tonal music. Of course, composers do not compose music simply by following a map and following arrows as much as we like to find explanations for why something is the way something is, composing is not a kind of painting by numbers. What interest would there be in music if it were simply a closed system following its own rules? And what individuality of expression would there be between different composers if all they were doing were simply to write music which followed a predetermined path? Even if the basic rules of tonality and of harmony are given to us through just a single note, this is just the lay of the land. The artistic creativity, and with that all the fun, began when musicians and composers started to play around, to expand, to bend and break these given natural tendencies. And we'll explore the consequences of this in the next series of this presentation.